Good morning, family. Welcome this morning to Bible Way Community Baptist Church, the place where Jesus Christ is still the Lord of all and the Word of God transformed life. We're excited and delighted that you have tuned in to be a part of our Sunday morning broadcast. As I always say, it's no accident, no coincidence that you've tuned in, but it's by the providence of Almighty God. God has something he wants to say, something he wants to do in your life. And so the Lord has directed you to be a part of our Sunday morning broadcast. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I wish that you would have been here last Sunday where you could have got this message uh, live, but uh, we are bringing it to you this morning. We're bringing it to you this morning. And it was a message that the Lord gave me, ladies and gentlemen, on Bible prophecy, uh, what's getting ready to happen to our world. <laughs> Listen, ladies and gentlemen, there is some danger that is getting ready to come to our world and very few ministers or people are even talking about it. I say that, that there is some destruction that's getting ready to come to our world. Now, I don't know when and I don't know, you know, the time and all that because the Bible don't really get into all of that. But the Bible tells us to warn the people, warn the people about what's getting ready to happen. Just like a weatherman warn us that a storm is coming. Then preachers need to be warning people. We need to be warning people. And so this message here is a warning. It's about the horses are coming. That's the title of it. The horses are coming. And so, uh, but before the horses come, before I talk about them horses, uh, let us get some good music to kind of get you in the spirit. And then I'll come back with the message entitled, The Horses Are Coming. The Horses Are Coming. So get ready, get ready, get ready. And let's have church.
and we praise you for who you are, the God who hear, and you still answer prayers. Thank you, Lord, for your marvelous grace. Thank you for your saving grace. But then thank you even for your keeping grace. Uh, like the male chorus just song, we went through hard trials and tribulations, but we are still here by the grace of God. Because we know it wasn't because we've been so good, holy or righteous, but it's your amazing grace. So we say thank you. Now, Lord, we ask that you will give us preaching grace as we stand before your people to preach your uncompromising words. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, for you are strength, you are redeemer. Besides you, there is no other. Be pleased, dear God, to save the lost. Encourage the backslider to come on back to you. And encourage the saints of God this morning to stay on the battlefield yes, yes. for the Lord. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on and put your hands together. Isn't God a good God? God is a good God. I always look forward to the third Sundays to hear the Lord's male chorus. This is the Lord's male chorus. I'm, I'm just so thankful, Brother Winston, for the Lord's male chorus. God is using our men. Do you believe it? I say, do you believe it? He's using our men in a great and a mighty way. Because what I like about these men, they are good, godly men. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I like. Uh, you can always find somebody that can sing. But can they live about what they sang about? That's what I like about our men. These, these men are born again. 
Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Amen. And, and, and that's what I like about Brother Winston. You, you, see, Brother Winston, uh, uh, you know, you know, brother, brother Winston, it's hard to pull one on him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Brother Winston come from the, the hood. I was trying to fix it, Winston, where it didn't sound that too bad. So, he can spot them when they come up. I'd be thinking that they good. That's a good one, Winston. When Winston doesn't check them out, he's no past. Lord have mercy. So thank God for Brother Winston. <laughs> Amen. All right. All right. Let's go on. Let's go on. Uh, high five somebody and tell them to buckle your seat belt because we're in for a ride. God bless you. You may be seated. You may be seated. God bless you. You may be seated. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. I'll give you my text and title after my introduction. Paul Revere is now famous for making his midnight ride. Lord have mercy. Let me start over. I got interrupted. I wanted to answer to make sure that this wasn't a call from heaven. <laughs> Amen. 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 So I had two introductions, and so I went with this introduction. So I said, now, wait a minute. Let me make sure that this... <laughs> This is the right one. <laughs> God is good. But Paul Revere is now famous for making his midnight ride, warning the colonies that the British are coming. Paul Revere is now a national hero because he woke up uh, his town and his community in his day, uh, warning them that danger is just right around the corner. Right. When I look at our world today, danger and destruction is right around the corner. But unfortunately, we have a sleepy church. Church folks done went to sleep and we don't have uh, no Paul Revere's going around and letting the folks know that the danger is coming. Uh, and there is a danger that's coming. As a matter of fact, John saw danger coming in the form of four horses that he saw uh, coming. Four horses that he saw Jesus unleashing upon this world that's gonna bring danger and destruction to this world like we have never seen before. Uh, can I show you those four horses today? Uh, open your Bibles to Revelation chapter six. In Revelation chapter 6, 1 through 8, you're going to see four horses that are going to bring destruction to our world. 
Look here at Revelation chapter 6 beginning with verse number 1 and I want to talk to you today about the horses are coming. The horses are coming. And tell your neighbor, tell somebody close to you that the horses are coming. Notice, notice, notice here, uh, this first horse that's coming here in Revelation chapter 6, beginning with verse number 1. It says, and I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to, be con and to conquer. Now, notice here we have the lamb opening the seals. Now, who is the lamb? That is none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is opening the seals. Remember in John chapter uh, 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 5 or uh, Revelation chapter 5, John saw uh, the Father uh, on the throne holding uh, a book with seven seals, but nobody could open it. And then Jesus came and he got the book that had those seven seals. Now he's opening the seals. And we see that the first seal that he opened is a, a white horse came out. As a matter of fact, the four, uh, one of the four beasts, uh, remember we saw the four beasts over in Revelation 4 and 5. Matter of fact, at that time I said I didn't know what those four beasts were. I didn't know if they were cherubim or whether they were seraphim, but I can tell you now they are, ser they are ch cherubim. I say they are cherubims. Uh, matter of fact, I've done research on that. And I went from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Uh, Reverend Gilman, I studied the tabernacle, and the tabernacle showed me that it's the uh, cherubims that's always there standing right on one side and one on the other side of God. Even when you look at the tabernacle, you always see one uh, uh, cherubim's on one side and one cherubim's on the other side of God. And you see these cherubim's are used by God to summon these horses. Uh, notice they tell the horse, the horses to come. And, and notice now uh, in the Greek that and see is not really in there. They tried to add that for clarity, but really it messed it up. It was basically just come. And it's, it's, it's not telling John to come because he's already there. It's telling the horses to come. It, it, in other words, now it's time to these horses have been wanting to come out. But God has got them fenced in. But now uh, it says, you can come on. And, and he says, and I saw and behold this white horse. Now uh, notice we have a white horse and somebody is riding this white horse. So we got a rider on the white horse. He that sat on him had a bow, but notice he got a bow, but no arrow. Is that in your Bible? It's just a bow, but no arrow. In other words, when he shows up on the scene, he shows up as a man of peace. He's coming with a bow, but no arrow. And notice, it says he got a crown on his head. A crown was given to him. And he went for conquering and to conquer. So this guy, I mean, he's coming and he's taking over the world. So what you got here, you got a world ruler that is coming. Now remember, uh, uh, at this time, the church done been raptured up. And so the world done fell to pieces. And so now we need somebody to put our world back together again. 
And so this, this man is going to come and he's going to be able to solve all of the world's problems. As a result, he's going to conquer the whole world. Now, a, a lot of people say that this is Christ that's coming. I don't believe that this is Christ. And see, the reason they say that this is Christ is because that he's wearing a crown and he's conquering the whole world. They also say that this is Christ because when Jesus come back, and those of you that know your Bible over in Revelation 19 says that he's going to be riding on a white horse. So a lot of people say, this ain't nobody but Jesus here. No, I, I don't believe this. This is Jesus. The reason I don't believe this is Jesus, because when you study this in the Greek, the word for crown here in Revelation 6 is basically just talking about a victor crown. One of those like olive reef kind of crown. The crown that Caesar will give to one of his generals once he done conquered territory. But when you read Revelation 19, the crown that Jesus is going to be wearing is a crown that uh, the Greek word is diathem, which means a royal crown. A, a crown that only the, a king can wear. And so I don't believe that this is a Jesus in, in Revelation 6 because he ain't got the right crown on to be Jesus. But also, whenever the Bible talks about Jesus, it always identifies Jesus in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, when it's talking about Jesus, it's going to identify him either as the Lamb, as the Lord, as the Savior, or it's, or it's going to tell you he's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And see, we have already got Jesus identified right here in verse 1, where it says he was the lamb that's opening up the seal. So he ain't opening up the seal, and when the horse started coming out, he run and jump on the horse. No, he's just opening the seal. Somebody else is riding the horse. See, I believe that this is not Christ, but I believe this is an Antichrist. Because, see, once the church done been raptured up and went home to be with the real Christ, then the world is looking for a savior. And then that's when the Antichrist is going to show up. And they're going to receive not the real Christ, but the fake Christ, the Antichrist. That's why he's showing up with the same kind of horse that Jesus got. Jesus is going to show up with a white horse, and now he's trying to imitate Jesus with a white horse. It's not the Christ, that's the Antichrist. And, and that's the danger of waiting till the rapture take place and then say, I'm, then I'm going to receive Jesus as my Savior. See, that's, that's the mistake that a lot of people are making. They want to wait till the horses show up and then they're going to say, oh, well, it's getting bad now. I better run on into the church and get right with the Lord. You're going to run on into the church, but you ain't going to get the real Christ. You're going to get the Antichrist. Oh, I know I'm right. Let me, let me go to Bible country on you. Look at what the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning with verse number 3 through 12. Uh, read it when you get home. Uh, if you can't uh, catch up with me right now, look at what it says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning with verse 3. It says, let no man deceive you. Right from the start, he says, don't let somebody fool you now uh, by any means. For that day shall not come except there comes a falling away first. And that man of sin 
be revealed. The son of petition. Notice he's telling you right there that the day of the Antichrist is not going to come until there's a falling away of church folks. Oh, we're getting pretty close. Uh, it used to be a time that we could see uh, the church is full, particularly before COVID. It's hard to fill them up after COVID. There is a falling away. And look what the Bible says. Uh, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Or that is worshipped. So that he as God. Set it in the temple of God. Showing himself that he's God. See. When the real Christ leave and take us home to be with him, the false Christ is going to show up. They're going to build a temple. He's going to sit in the temple and say, y'all looking for God? He is. And the people are going to fall for it. Verse number five. It says, remember ye not that, I, uh, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know. Uh, but withhold it that he might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Yeah, folks are coming up with stuff that you ain't never heard of before. And it's a mystery how they doing stuff. Lord have mercy. He said the mystery of iniquity is already working. <laughs> Only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Who's the he there, y'all, that's talking about? In, in other words, it could get worse, but the he is standing in the way of the Satan's program. Who is the he? It is the Holy Ghost in the people of God. See, people are hating on the people of God but the reason our, our hell ain't broke loose is because the Holy Spirit is still here working through the people of God. But when the Holy Spirit decides that these folks ain't going to behave, let me get my people on out of here, then all hell is going to break loose. Look at, look at what he says. He says, here in verse number eight, and, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Somebody ought to say, and then, and then. Uh, shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. This guy's following Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders. See, people are going to fall for it because he's going to be coming here working all kind of miracles. Yeah. We see that even happening today. A, a preacher can come to town and because he get on stage and then some folks in them fall down, he lay hands on them, they fall down, they, they pack the stadium out running after him. Yeah. Yeah. He'll blow on some and they fall down and they pack the stadium out. Yeah. Lord have mercy. And, and that's what's going to happen here. Notice verse number 11. I'm almost done with this part, y'all. Notice what it says. Verse 10. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. I mean, he's going to be deceiving people left and right. Because they receive not the love of truth that they might be saved. Oops, there it is. Did you see it right there in your Bible? Why is God letting these people be tricked like this? He says, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They had a chance to receive the Christ, but they were messed up and rejected the true Christ and God don't like it when folks reject his only begotten son. 
when you reject Jesus Christ, that's the worst thing that you can do. Because that's the best thing that God got. It's Jesus. And when you don't want Jesus, he says that if they don't want my son, they don't want Christ, I'm going to give them the Antichrist. Look here in verse number 11. He says, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. God says, I'm going to fix it where you're going to believe the lie rather than believe in the truth. Verse 12, that they all might be damned. Go to hell. That's what he's saying. Who believe not the truth. See, they had a chance to believe the truth. But had pleasure in unrighteousness. Let me tell you, that's why when you get a chance to receive Jesus as your Savior, you better jump on board right quick. Because sometimes you don't get another chance. And that's what God is saying. God is saying that I've had their chance. And I'm going to fix it now where they're going to believe the lie rather than believing the truth. See, most people think that, well, I can just get saved whenever I want to get saved. <laughs> no, you can't. Read your Bible. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 tell you, for by grace... You have been saved, watch this, through faith. And he said, and that's not of yourself. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. See, God have to give you the faith, but then he have to produce the object of your faith to believe in the right one. In this particular case, God says, okay, after Jesus done came and unraptured his church, they're going to have faith, but they're going to put their faith not in Christ, but in the Antichrist. They thinking that they getting there. Well, I'm getting right now because I'm putting my faith in, in Christ. I know that man is Christ. No, they are believing. God's giving them the faith to believe in the Antichrist. All because when they had a chance to use their faith to put it in the real Christ, God says, well, now that the real Christ is out of the way, I'm going to bring a substitute, the Antichrist. That's why the Bible says, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of your salvation. Oh, but it get worse than that, ladies and gentlemen. Look here, that was just the first horse that was riding. Look at the second horse here. Back over in Revelation chapter 6, beginning with verse 3 and 4. It says, and when he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereof to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another and there was given unto him a great sword. Now think about it. The Antichrist is going to show up and he's going to be a man of peace. He's going to solve everybody's problem. But then all of a sudden he's going to turn on the people and he's going to get the military involved and he's going to take away peace from this world when he started implementing his agenda. And we think it's bad now with that war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh-uh. That's just over there in Ukraine. What we're getting ready to see is a world war where it's a war everywhere where war now done came to your neighborhood. This ain't Mr. Rogers' neighborhood no more. And you're not going to know who to trust. 
No, notice now, he using these imageries as the horse. Why is that? Because back in Bible days, the horse was looked upon as a great, powerful military weapon. It was the fastest animal that you could ride back in Bible day, and it was most powerful animal that you could ride. And the thing about a horse, a horse is fearless in battle. A horse can be, two horses can be charging towards each other and neither one of them will blink. And that's what we're going to be having here. We're going to have war that is going on. Ain't nobody blinking here. I, I, I mean, it's going to be, uh, uh, we think that World War I and World War II was bad. We ain't seen nothing yet. And the thing about war, you don't know who to trust in a war. And see, the thing that you notice right here in your Bible, it says that he gave them uh, a power of the authority to kill one another. In other words, people are going to be turning on one another. Folks that used to be your friend is no longer your friends. Uh, even family members uh, that used to be close family members are turning on one another. See, when the government get involved and, and some folks start following the Antichrist and then other folks say, I don't want to follow the Antichrist, they're going to start turning one another in. It was just like during the COVID when it first came out and they started talking about the shots and stuff. You had people turning on one another. The, those that, that was getting the shots and those that wasn't getting the shots, they was enemies almost like. Even family members, family members say, well, you can't come down, down to my house for Thanksgiving if you ain't had your shot. I mean, they was turning on one another. And we're going to see folks going to be turning on one another, hating on one another. You, you're not going to know who to believe. Because somebody could be a spy right there in your household. The people are going to be turning in their own mamas and daddies and sisters and brothers and nieces and nephews. I mean, it's going to be on like neck bones. You know, I grew up watching. Uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, movies, the movies about the Vietnam War. And the thing that uh, was a scary thing, the Viet Cong, they would often take these little bitty children and they would give them a grenade and then they would go to the American soldiers camp and then they would pull the pin on the grenade and roll that grenade in the uh, camp there and then they would run. Or either they would sometime even put bombs on or scrap bombs on little bitty babies like. And them little babies, they would be running towards the American soldier and the American soldier would be confused. He didn't know whether to run to that baby and get the baby out of harm way. Uh, he didn't know whether to run from that baby or he didn't know whether to shoot the baby. Because during time of war, you don't know who to trust. You don't know who the enemy is. And this is what's going to be happening. So we say that the white horse is going to be riding. The Antichrist. We're going to see the, the red horse. War is going to be. But then you're going to see the third horse, which is the black horse. Look here. At verse number five, it says, and when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny or a denarius. And three measures of barley for a penny or a denarius. And see, thou hurt not all and the wine. Now notice, John says, I was looking and I saw this black horse show up on the scene. The black horse is representing famine. 
Because see, right after war, the natural thing that happens as a result of war is famine. Food shortage. Folks ain't got no food. And notice, it's a black horse that shows up because right before a person dies, a lot of time, their bodies start turning dark and black. And so we see the white uh, of this black horse is showing up, it's riding on the scene here. And you, the voice said, measure out a measure of wheat for a denarius or for a penny. Back in Bible days, a denarius was a day's wages. Now think about it, this person has taken all the money they made for that day in order to buy some wheat bread. Right. Did, you, did you notice that? Yeah. To buy some, I don't know if y'all feeling me. Right. Now notice, 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 not a whole loaf, just a measure, just enough for one person. So what we are talking about here, let me just see, can I boil it down and, and put it in our day and age language. Let's say a person make $100 a day, $500 a week. In order for them to buy two slices of bread, they got to give up a whole day worth of work to just buy two slices of bread. Just enough for them to have some daily bread. A measure, not a loaf of bread. Just enough for you to fix a sandwich with. And have you ever had a bread sandwich? Yes. That's why you just take two pieces of bread and you mash them together and you eat it. That's a bread sandwich. Yes. Lord have mercy. You ain't got no meat. See, if you're having a hamburger, you'll have hamburger meat in between the two pieces of bread. But you ain't got no hamburger meat. But you say, but I got a family. I got a wife and I got a daughter. Well, you need to buy you some white bread then. Rather than trying to buy the high price stuff, the wheat. You better get you some white bread because you can get six pieces of white bread for that same hundred dollars. Now you think about that, somebody say, well pastor, well what about rent? You ain't got no money for no rent. As a matter of fact, during time of war, very few people even gonna be staying in a house. You lucky to have a job, you blessed to have a job. Cause most people don't have a job during war time. When the enemy done invaded the land. And so they are blessed in one sense to have a, a job. But notice, uh, uh, they are told, don't worry about uh, messing with the oil and the wine. See, that's luxury stuff. Yeah, yeah see, your booze, that's extra. That's after you done got grocery, then you get your booze. Well, when you ain't even hardly getting no bread, you can't even be thinking about no booze. Lord have mercy. <laughs> look, look, but it get worse than that. We have saw the white horse ride. We don't saw the red horse ride. We don't saw the black horse ride. But notice we got one more horse that's riding. Verse number seven, we see a pale horse that's riding. It says, verse seven, and when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four beasts say, come and see. Oh, I wish they hadn't put that part in there. But it says, come. And it says, and I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that set on him was death and Hades followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beast of the earth. Notice here 
<laughs> we got a spirit of death that's riding the land. <laughs> and notice, if the war didn't get you, then he says hunger is going to get you, the famine. But if famine don't get you, that word for death there means the pestilence. In other words, uh, sickness will get you. Uh, in other words, stuff like COVID, but we thought that COVID was bad. It's going to be something worse than COVID. But if that don't get, get you, then it says, and, and then the beast of the earth is going, yeah, because see, the animals got to eat something. See, ain't nobody going to be going around and buying some dog food. Now, any dog food that you're going to be buying, you're going to be eating that for you. You ain't been be, be buying no Purina dog food. No, as a matter of fact, it's going to be on between you and Rover. <laughs> you, you're going to either have to eat some dog or the dog is going to eat you. Now, a lot of people say, well, I ain't, we don't have to worry about that, you know. You know, America is the home of the free, the land of the free, the home of the brave. You know, God is going to take care of us. Wait a minute now. You ain't been reading your Bible. <laughs> Look at what God told Israel before they got into the promised land. Uh, Leviticus, the third book of the Bible. Now, hold your place here in Revelation because we're coming back to it. Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26, beginning with verse number 21 through 26. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, God, God so count, I'm going to bring y'all into that promised land. But watch what God says in verse 21. He says, and if you walk contrary unto me, in other words, you get over there with all them blessings and you get beside yourself and will not hearken unto me. You know, sometimes folks, you know, can get blessed, you know, with nice clothes, house and, and, and cars and what, and they get beside themselves. God said, you start acting like that. He says, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. And I will send, watch this, wild beasts among you which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in numbers and your highways will be desolated. Oops, did you see it? God says, I'll send those wild beasts. Wolves will start showing. He said, where are these wolves coming from? God says, I'm sending wolves. I'm sending hyenas. We ain't never seen no hyenas around him. All these wild animals are start showing up and the next thing you know, your children are missing. Because the animals, they hunting, not other animals, they hunt children now. And notice, you're going to have a shutdown going on. People going to start, uh, they see danger on the outside, so they're going to come on the inside. And the highway is going to be desolated. Didn't we see that with COVID? Stuff got so bad on the outside that all of us were shut up in our houses on the inside. And when you went out there on the highway, you could pick whatever lane you wanted to ride in. Amen. The highways was desolated. They were so empty, it was scary. I said, what is I'm doing out here? Everybody else at home, let me hurry up and get home. Do these people know something Winston, that I don't know? I'm the only one out here riding. And you can tell, you know, when, you, when you're out there by yourself, you start waving at folks when you just see a car. Hey! <laughs> you're just glad to see somebody. <laughs> Notice what he says, verse 23. And if you will not 
be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me. God said, you won't, you won't listen. Then will I walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword uh, upon you that shall avenge the quarrels of my covenant. And when you are gathered together within your cities, uh, I will send the pestilence among you and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. Notice, see the people, they leave in the country because they can't go outside. They go outside, uh, the, the, the wolves and stuff going to get them. And so now they said, we need to go to Chicago. We need to go to New York. They, they said they got some food up there and they ain't worried about no, uh, no wolves and stuff. And so come on up here to Memphis. Come on up here to Chicago. They're going to get up there and everybody going to get sick. Because God says, I'm after you. He sent the beast after you. He sent the sword after you. Then God says, I send pestilence after you. And then he said, if you still won't listen. Verse 26, he says, and when I have broken the staff of your bread, 10 women's shall break, bake your bread in one oven and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. Notice that now, you got 10 women sharing one stove. Why is that? That's how it is in a refugee camp. You ain't got your own stove in a refugee camp. You glad to just have one stove. And notice you're going to have like 10 women trying to cook on one stove, but they ain't got no food. They're measuring out food. In other words, they are rationing it. So you ain't getting a bowl of rice. You may get a cup of rice. Lord have mercy. And when you get your food, you know what you say? Is that all? That's it. That's it. Because see, you done fell up under the judgment of God. This is the judgment of God. These four different ways that God is punishing the people, that's the judgment of God. You said, stop, did that really happen? Yeah, oh, you, I wish I had time. But read the book of Jeremiah. Read the book of Ezekiel. Read the book of Daniel. And you'll see that God bought these four judgments on Israel. And that's why Jerusalem fell down because of their sin. And God judged the people just like he said he would. See, when God makes a promise, God is a promise keeper. He's not a promise breaker. And if God promised you a whipping, God is going to whip you. Now, a lot of people uh, uh, say, well, God ain't no whip us. You know, listen, did he whip Israel? Did Jerusalem fall? God's chosen people? Well, if this can happen to God's chosen people, what you think about us here in America that's sitting a hundred miles an hour? We overdue for the judgment of God. You know, but when you, when you, when you look back at this story here in Revelation chapter 6, the sad thing about this Revelation 6 and 8 that this ride on this pale horse, and you know why uh, the, the horse is pale, is because when fear comes, oh, let me bag up, when a person get angry, all that blood just rush. You can see it in our white brothers. I, I mean, they turn red as a firecracker. Yeah. But when fear comes, it's like all the blood leaves out of them. They turn white as snow. People turn white. It's like they done seen a ghost. 
and that's what's going to happen. I mean, this is going to be a fearful time. They're going to turn, people are going to be uh, pale skinned. It's like they done seen a ghost. And they need to be pale skinned because uh, uh, this rider, all the rest of the rider was riding by himself. But this rider here, it's got death and Hades. <laughs> now, normally, when a person die, the death angel will come and then take that person on to Haiti. See, a lot of people think that when I die and I go before the judgment, I'm going to have a chance to tell God. I, I'll be able to talk to God about this, you know, how it was and, and, and why I didn't go to church and why I didn't do what I post. You know, they, see, most people think that they're going to go to Reb Gilman, a holding tank, a place like purgatory. You know, they're going to go down there and then once I get everything, you know, kind of straightened out and then I'm going to go on to heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but, I, but I'm going to the changing room first and I get myself straight. It ain't like that at all. Like I said, normally the death angel comes. But notice, <laughs> hell says, I ain't even waiting. I'll ride with you. So as soon as they die, I'll claim them and take them right on to hell myself. Death and Hades is riding together. And so we done saw four riders. We done saw the white horse and his rider. We done saw the red horse and his rider. We done saw the black horse and his rider. We done saw the pale horse and his rider. So how should we respond uh, to these riders? Can I give you three things right quick because we we're running out of time first of all watch out for the signs that the horses are coming watch out for the signs that the horses are coming the disciples one day they asked Jesus Jesus when is the sign of the end and when is going to be your return and Jesus says right at the top, don't let no man deceive you. Because many is going to be coming in my name saying, I am the Christ. But he said, don't you believe it? And then he says, you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars. And then he says, you're going to see uh, pestilence. And then you're going to see earthquakes in various places but he says that ain't the end this is just the beginning of sorrow so what we see and happen over in Russia that's just the beginning I'm sorry, that ain't the end that's just the beginning we see famine taking place in Epinopia uh, as a result of the war there in Russia that's just the beginning of the sorrow. This is a sign that the horses are coming. Don't just be looking at the news. That's God is giving you signs. Amen. The horses are coming. See, how do you know a lady is getting ready to have a baby? <laughs> she start having birth pains. But the birth pain begin to get, number one, harder. And then they start coming quicker, faster. Listen, we are seeing stuff that come, one thing, come right after that, and it's coming faster and harder, faster and harder. Jesus said, when you see it coming like birth pain, you ought to know that the horses is coming. But number two, warn the people that the horses are coming. God wrote this for us to act like we are Paul Revere. Warn the people. You say, but I don't see the horses. When you see the horses, it's going to be too late. We got to be like Noah. Noah had faith that it was going to rain. He 
didn't wait for the rain. Say, oh, that's the rain God is talking about. Let me run out here and warn. No, it's too late now. Why is it though we don't warn the people? Why we don't warn the people? Could it be that we are so wrapped up in ourselves? Trying to keep up with the Joneses. You know, we live in a day and age of selfishness. Let me take, let me take me another selfie here. We're living in the day. And then, then we got a post. I got to send this to my friend. They don't need to see another picture of you. They know how you look. Lord have mercy. And then we fall out with people oh, when they unfriend us. Or they don't like us. Or somebody got more likes on their Facebook page than I do. And we start having a pity party. You know, that's what happened to Jeremiah. God sent Jeremiah to warn the people, but, but Jeremiah came back to God and said, but God, they won't listen to me and they don't like me. Listen to what God tells Jeremiah. I think this is very insightful in Jeremiah 12 and 5. Read it when you get home. It says, he told Jeremiah, if thou hast run with the footmans and they have wearied thee, then how can thou contend with the horses? He said, if the average person, that, I, I mean, if people them that, that's just, just got two feet, if they win you out, just wait for the army to come that's going to be riding horses. Oh, you ain't getting this. If the person on your job that's got two feet is scratching you out, just wait till you see the foreign army come over here like Russia and China that bring those army tanks over here. See something is coming that's a whole lot worse than folks don't like you on your job. Do you know hell is going to be full of people who are angry with church folks. They're going to they gonna say, wait a minute. I worked right next to a Christian every day. And they never told me about the horses was coming. They didn't tell me nothing about no antichrist and uh, uh, the wars and the rumors of war. They, they, they never took the, what was happening on the news and applied it to the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody out there saying, well, I didn't know it. You know, I didn't know about these hearts that was coming, Pastor. Well, you know now. Amen. So go to your job and warn somebody. Take them this sermon. Preach it to them and let them know you better get right because the horses are coming. Third thing, get out the way before the horses come. Get out the way before the horses come. It's just like when you are going across a railroad track and you hear that train blow its horn, there ain't no time to be slow poking. Is that a train? Let me stop the car and see, is that a train? Let's see, I know I heard a train. No! If you heard a, a train, go on and put it on in gear and get on out the way. Danger is coming. Don't get out the car and start playing on the train track. Uh, answering, let, let me catch this call here on the train. Let me call uh, a Susie here on the, get off the train track. But you say, yeah, I see the train, but they ain't even left the depot yet. No, when you hear that horn, 
Don't be taking chance. That's a sign that he coming. You know, I thank God because God could turn these horses loose right now. But it's just the mercy of God. See, see, somebody ought to be asking, why come God won't turn the horses loose? Why has God got these horses caged up? Because God says, I'm giving them another chance. I know that some of them are not ready yet. So, so horses, stay back. God is keeping the gate closed to give somebody another chance to get right. You know, uh, when storms like hurricanes, when they come, now are, we got weather men that warns us that a storm is coming. And I remember when Katrina was coming, uh, the weather people began to tell everybody that the storm is coming. And you had the mayor of New Orleans warning people that the storm is coming. And you had the governor of uh, Mississippi and Louisiana warning people that you're going to have to go to higher ground. And a lot of people, they waited around until it was really uh, too late because they did try to leave town, but they got stuck out there on the highway. Some people ran out of gas and everything out there on the highway. And so now the highway department they know better, and so now, in order to evacuate people, they reverse the inbound lanes that's coming into a city. So if there's two lanes that's leaving the city and two lanes coming into the city, they reverse those two lanes that's coming into the city, and now they make all the lanes leave the city. So three lanes coming in and three lanes going out. Now they reverse those three lanes coming in. Now they got six lanes going out. And so they got a better evacuation plan. Listen, if you count on A, B, C, anything but Christ. You need a better plan. If you counting on Buddha to get you out of this, if you counting on Mohammed to get you out of this, if you counting on Confucius to get you out of this, you're going to get stuck down here when the horses come. Oh, but the good news, I say the good news is there is somebody that can get you out of this before the horses come and there's nobody but Jesus. Jesus, number one, is the one that's controlling the horses and he's the one that can get you out of here before the horses come. And so put your faith, put your trust in Jesus. Because Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say I was one of the ways. He says, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No man can get to the Father, but come by me. And when you get Jesus, you'll be able to dodge these horses. As a matter of fact, you'll be able to watch it from the grandstands up there in heaven. And you're going to be able to sing in that old Negro spiritual. I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. Glory. Somebody ought to say glory. I say glory. 
Somebody ought to say glory. glory. Glory, hallelujah. Aren't you glad? I say, aren't you glad? I say, aren't you glad that Jesus 